everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Tracy Vittorio. I am the Teen Services Librarian here at Plainfield Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm happy to welcome back Tom. He's uh, visited us many times here at Plainfield Public Library, both in person and in the last couple of years virtually, which has been great because he provides so much wonderful information on the college search. It's what he does. He'll tell you a little bit about what his background and what he does. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about the college admission process from start to finish, which can be a scary time for all parents and kids and everybody who has, has ever gone through it knows it can be stressful. And Tom always gives really great tips, helps you feel a little better about what you're getting yourself into and ways that you can uh, learn about costs and all, wonder, all the things you need to know as you're going through the process. I just wanted to go over a few things real quick. Uh, feel free at any time to type any questions into the chat on YouTube and I will be able to um, get those questions to Tom. Uh, we can address them as we're going through um, tonight and then we'll save some time at the end for uh, specific questions as well. Uh, we do have some events coming up here at Plainfield I wanna let you know about. Um, if you do have someone who is thinking about college, uh, on Saturday, April 18th, uh, we're offering a practice SAT test, which will be uh, ho presented by Sylvan of Plainfield. You're welcome to uh, sign up. Anyone in grades nine to 12 can come to that. You get to take a practice test and then you'll get results in just a few days. Um, and our big events coming up are our annual Fandom Fest. We're lucky to be back in person this year. We're really excited about that. It's gonna be on Saturday, April 23rd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We're gonna have character meet and greets. We just, uh, the members of the 501st um, Star Wars group is gonna be here. Uh, we have a fashion show, a cosplay contest. So if you uh, dress up as some favorite characters, please enter that. Um, we're gonna have a lot of fun with that. We have um, 18 artists that are gonna be here displaying uh, their work and products that they sell. Uh, a lot of things related to comics and some of your favorite movies and TV shows. Uh, whatever you're into, we have somebody who probably has products related to it. And uh, we're gonna have some giveaways and make take and makes that day as well. So it's a great time. We're gonna have uh, photo opportunities and then we're gonna have a cosplayer or cafe that you can come to as well. And the night before that, the event I'm most excited about is our uh, Promicon. We're back in person this year. This is an after hours event at the library for grade seven through 12. Um, it's sort of an alternative prom. So uh, we have kids that come dressed up in cosplay, like their favorite anime characters. And we have other kids that come dressed up like they're going to the, the fanciest event, or they can come in jeans and a t-shirt. We don't care. Whatever they want to wear is okay with us. Uh, we have a live DJ here uh, who um, is set up in our area. We do um, fandom related mocktails. Uh, we have a room just set up. If you want to go play Dungeons and Dragons and hang out in a quiet space for a while, we have that for you. Uh, we tend to, you know, just do a lot of fun things here at the libraries from seven to 10 that night. Um, it's a great opportunity. And this year we're going to have really cool giveaway bags that we're giving away to everyone who attends. So we hope to see some of you there for that. So I don't want to take up all my time talking about library stuff because I want to give Tom plenty of time to talk to you about what he does. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Tom Jaworski. Great, Tracy. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it and great Thank to be you. back here. But um, I completely understand it. Exciting to talk about in-person programming again and all the cool things you get to do again. So not a problem. It looks pretty fun, too. Uh, well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming out tonight. I greatly appreciate that. And again, I, I love being back at the Plainfield Library. And I'm sure I'll make it back down uh, again one day soon. Um, but again, uh, so today, the college admission process from start to finish. Um, I am Tom Jaworski, if you haven't seen me before. Um, again, I'm the a founder of Quest College Consulting. It's my own business. Um, and I'll explain that really quick to you as we go through this. Um, as Tracy had mentioned, uh, feel free at any point to type in a uh, comment into the uh, chat feature here as well. I know uh, some other people may be uh, viewing this on uh, on YouTube or different ways as well. So if your chat can come on in, great. Uh, if not, Tracy might better catch them and ask me. But feel free to ask at any point as well, too. I know some information could be confusing at that moment. And feel free to ask it. If not, please save it to the end. Um, as I always joke, I'll be here as long as Tracy uh, wants to keep me around for until she kicks me out of here. So uh, feel free to ask at any point. Um, so again, I, I'm founder of Quest College Consulting, but my background is I used to be a high school history teacher. That's what got me started in this profession, graduated from college, uh, went as a history teacher, and it all, as all teachers uh, do, after a year or two, I started going back and I eventually earned my master's degree in school counseling. 
Uh, the school I worked at was a wonderful, smaller private high school, and they opened up a position for me in the counseling department that I didn't think would, they would, but they did. Um, uh, and they opened a position in an honors program that, that we had at the school, uh, and I became the private college counselor to just that honors group too. So there was a, the top, you know, uh, 20, 25 students in the class, and, and uh, the, pretty much it was, congratulations, you're, uh, you're, you know, you're in honors program as a freshman. What are you going to do for college? So I built them up for four years. Their uh, activities, their extracurriculars, and, and exposed them to colleges, and then helped them with the application process. Really enjoyed that feature, but working at, in a high school for uh, for 12 years, I had the entrepreneurial spirit uh, always in the back of my mind, and my wife is the one who actually told me to go out and become that private college counselor. So now going on 10 years uh, as a private college counselor full-time. Uh, first year I did both, but I'm now full-time as an independent educational consultant is my fancy title, but private college counselor, yeah, that pretty much helps uh, high school families uh, find colleges, uh, match them up with a, a career path or college major with the co with the right college. Um, helping as I'm starting to do now with, with some juniors, helping with the college application process, start to put all the pieces to the puzzle together for the applications and then start eventually working on the essays as well. That's what I do. And then throughout the entire part of the process, not just at the end of the process. So I know I always joke, it's, it's becoming April and I will get that phone call very soon about uh, my son or daughter is in college, is going to go off to college in a few months, uh, and I can't pay for it. Or what can you do to help me? And at this point, my, uh, my money tree is still bare, and it's starting to bud, but I don't have any money to help with that. But it goes along with the entire part of the process, especially in the beginning of, of choosing the right colleges to apply for and searching for those. Um, so great. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what I do in a nutshell. But today, we're just going to be talking about the college admission process from start to finish. So how we structure this program is, is I'll tell you a whole bunch about the college uh, uh, admission process. Um, and I kind of jump around a little bit, trying to focus on sort of, say, the applications, the financial aid portion, and what goes into the application, what goes into the financial aid portion. So it will be maybe a little bit disjointed, but try to keep those themes together. And in the end, I will take the whole timeline and going, here's what we're going to go. We're going to do it this way. I'm going to go that way. So um, I, I'll help you out and kind of explain, put everything together in chronological order for you, and then final, uh, finish up with the final four tips that we have going on. Uh, even though we have the NCAA men's championship game today, uh, we'll still go with the final four tips here at the end. Um, so great. Without further ado, uh, let's get started. And if, uh, by the way, at the end, I will also uh, have my email address on uh, on the last slide, but at various points, you know, Tracy's really good with this to, to put my email address up, and there she is. She's listening intently. Um, feel free to email me at any point if you want a copy of the presentation. I'm happy to send it out to you. There are some links that go in with this presentation that I probably won't be clicking on here uh, because on my end is a little bit different, uh, not necessarily the Zoom we're using here, so it was a little bit a little tricky on my end here. But there are some links. I'll talk about those different links, and um, then if you want the presentation, and you can click on those yourself, it'll be a lot easier for you to find things as well too. So feel free to email me at any point here for this. Um, so starting with the, with the college uh, application process here, uh, there are kind of three different ways to apply to college. The first one is with the common application, which is an application that's common to over 900 different colleges right now. It's about 930-ish right now uh, is the number, uh, which includes for the first time this past admission season, so if for, for the current seniors, the first time that all Illinois public universities were on the common application. Previously to that, it was up to the uh, to the school if they wanted uh, to or not, but uh, the Illinois uh, legislature has been trying to make college more accessible to all students and remove all the different barriers to it and try to make it a little bit easier, which is, by the way, uh, I might be jumping ahead, but one reason, if you have heard, uh, one of the Illinois state graduation requirements, and that was one of the emails I was replying to just before this, uh, uh, it is an Illinois state graduation requirement to complete the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, and also to take the, an SAT exam before you graduate too. So uh, so that is one of the reasons is, is the legislature does not want students to say, well, I don't have a test score, I can't apply, I didn't complete a FAFSA, I can't receive any money, I can't afford it. So they're trying to remove those barriers. So saying that on the Common App, all Illinois public universities have to be on there. So that meant the University of Illinois was on there for the first time ever. They were on a 
another application. The next two slides actually uh, were ways you could apply to, but this year was the first time there. And not coincidentally, um, that uh, U of I, their application actually uh, jumped about 33%. Now, part of that has to do with a change in admission process here, um, with students are applying to a lot more schools, uh, but they also were on the common application, which made, it did remove some barriers and made it easier for students to, to apply to the school as well. So, so Illinois jumped up. Uh, as most schools have probably had with admission. But we'll get to that later. So the common application, the whole point of this uh, slide here is talking about how and what the common app looks like. Common app is a slang term. So what you, what it is is you complete about 80% of the application, 80 to 90% of the application, you complete uh, is common to all 930 colleges. Uh, and so what that might mean is, is that uh, there are um, seven different essay prompts but don't freak out with that seven prompts or seven prompts. You only answer one of those different prompts. And I believe in our future slide, I have a link for, for the, the current question that would be there. The release by March 31st, they usually say, but in the beginning of February, uh, the Common App came out and said um, something to the effect of, you know, I know a lot of things have been changing. So one thing we don't need to, need to change is our essay prompts. It's been probably five years or so with the same prompt. They said there is no point for us changing these prompts. They seem to be working well. Uh, the feedback was good, so we're gonna stick with it. So the same prompts that have been there for, for the last year, not that it makes any difference for current juniors or sophomores, but the same prompts are, are gonna be there for next year as well. Now, one aspect that can be a non-common, for instance, to the schools like U of I, is uh, schools can add additional supplemental essays. So you have to answer one of the seven prompts in up to 650 words. And uh, there are additional supplemental essays that the uh, colleges can ask if they so choose. University of Illinois, for instance, they, uh, they have two additional essay prompts at uh, up to 150 words, which you may think, oh, 150 words, that's not too hard. Actually, I think sometimes these shorter essays tend to be smaller because you need to get all your information in there in 150 words and cram it all together and still sound good. Uh, but that, to me, that's a challenge of that. But I'm not the one writing it. I'm just the one helping and editing it for, uh, for my clients. But those optional supplemental essays will be out by usually by August 1st. They trickle out throughout the summer so you can kind of reach out to colleges or, or look at various websites to find that information as well. But you have to write some essays. There are optional essays as well, too. There is an additional information essay, which is optional, but it means if you need to give some additional information about yourself that it does not ask anywhere else, you want to elaborate about something else, you can put that information in there, but strictly optional. And then the past couple of years, and I'm sure they'll probably add it for next year, too, is a COVID-19 essay. Pretty much if somehow COVID-19 has impacted you somehow more than Traditionally, the we want to remote learning, uh, so I missed out on this internship, so on and so forth. You can write that in up to 250 words. Um, but that is something that, um, again, it is completely optional, but the, pretty much the purpose of that there is to stop people from writing about COVID and, and their stories about COVID in the main essay. They kind of want to know something different there. Okay, off the essay. So you get, they will review you holistically. So they're look at your essays. Is only one portion, again, uh, they're going to look at letters of recommendations if uh, they they want them, if they're applicable. Uh, speaking of uh, UIUC, it is not applicable as U of I does not require and does not accept any letters of recommendations from from uh, from anybody. So some colleges will say they're optional. If you want to send it to us, great. U of I says we're not going to read it at all. Some say you have to write one. Some, some of the highly selected schools may ask for two, but that's usually the, the most. But some will take optional ones as well, too. Um, then you're also going to look at your extracurriculars slash your resume, which is pretty much anything you do outside the school hours. So, uh, you know, if it's clubs, if it's activities, if it's sports, if it's a job, if it's a hobby, if it's an internship, it is pretty much anything you want to write about at, at that point there. Um, they will also look at um, uh, your class rank, if it's applicable. Again, if that's something your, your school uh, does, they'll look at your grade point average, which is actually a bigger factor these days, a grade point average, than your standardized exam, uh, if that's applicable as well. So as you're already hearing from me, there's a, you know, if applicable for a lot, every single college is going to be different about how you apply. 
even if they're on the common application, but about 80% is common. 20% of that is not going to be common. It's going to be specific to that school. But the common app is really nice because it really saves you from doing all those monotonous, the boring uh, parts, as I kind of uh, say, kind of like your name, the classes you've taken, the high school you're at, so on and so forth, all that information too. Um, all right, so we'll keep going here. The, the other application, which hasn't really gained as much traction uh, as it had in, in the past here, uh, as they thought it probably would be, is the Coalition for um, Access, Affordability, and Success, otherwise known as the Coalition application, the Coalition app. This currently has 151 members, and like I said, it really just hasn't taken off as much. The idea was it was started by 30 highly selective colleges, the idea to make college applying to college easier, which is kind of an oxymoron coming from colleges because they give you a new application to apply instead of an old application and they make it harder because you got to fill another one. Okay. But anyways, rant aside here, uh, his 151 members is not growing as fast, but um, uh, it, there are 12 schools that are not on a common application. You said U of I was one of them. They dropped out or not. They're still in a coalition if you wanted to. They're on the common app if you wanted to. But there are 12 schools that are not on the common app that are on the coalition. And I heard some rumblings. I couldn't find it. I was trying to do some research on it this weekend, but I couldn't find it. I, I have a colleague in Texas, and she said that Texas A&M and University of uh, Texas Austin, UT Austin, is looking to, to go to the uh, common app, which they're not on. They're on a coalition app right now. So that could be even easier as well, too. Pretty much the University of Washington is the one holdout school that is the only way for you to apply to college is to use this coalition application, which is very similar to common app. Uh, 80% of it is common. Uh, same holistic review as the application, kind of the same things there. They have five essay prompts, which the question there is general, just like the common app, by the way. Those are very general in itself there. The essay prompts, whatever you write for the coalition, you can use for the common and vice versa, common for coalition. So don't have your son or daughter freak out. It's just going to take you a little bit longer to kind of, you know, cut and paste the essay and kind of type in some more things. Uh, there are certain differences, like the activities. You can put up to 20, I believe, on the, on the coalition. Um, and then you can also, the, the description is a little bit longer than the common app, so on and so forth. But there's other things you can juggle. But the big feature for the coalition that they try to sell you on is that you can start this from day one of high school, from freshman year, create an account, and then you get a locker. So this locker, you can put things in, right, with the idea not that the high school students use lockers these days. But if they use the locker, they can put things in there for four years, for three years, and then when they're applying senior year, they can pull it out and say, ah, oh, here it is. If it's awards I had, you can start completing uh, uh, you know, uh, activity sheets in there. If it's a great essay because sometimes some colleges ask for a graded essay. I know Princeton uh, has been good for that. Brown has as well, too. They send you after you apply, they send us a graded essay now, which is kind of weird because you're like, I need to have a graded essay. I didn't throw it away necessarily, but I need my teacher to grade it again. It's kind of kind of weird, but that's what they ask for. And if you want to go to the Ivy League school, you're going to jump through those hoops. But that's something you could put in your locker, for instance, as well, too, and kind of keep the information there. Uh, and like, especially from freshman year, it might be something you forgot. So if there's a, you could take a picture of it, right, of, of a certain award or something, and you could kind of put it in your locker, forget about it. And if it's, uh, you know, like, uh, well, I only have a nine-year-old, uh, but I don't have a, a high schooler yet, but I can't imagine how disorganized he's going to be as a freshman. So uh, you could kind of keep him organized that way as well, too. So it's something you can start as a freshman and slowly start completing if needed as well. Um, or the third way to apply is what I call the school-specific applications. That's what I what I call it. I mean, there's various other ways. Um, University of California system has their own application, so you can only apply to UC Berkeley, UCLA, and all those other schools uh, through their application. Cal State as well, too. Uh, apply Texas, so uh, you couldn't go to coalition application for UT Austin, Texas A&M. Or for all the Texas universities, there's an application called Apply Texas. They'll all, all be on there as well, too. But some schools, you can apply to these schools as well through the Common App, or it's very simple, actually, which is what I uh, when I recommend when people are when I'm working with them and they say, I want to apply to Iowa or Kansas. And just go to their website and do it their way. It is so much simpler, to be honest with you. It'll take you half an hour, but it's not going to be a, a half an hour. That's going to be a waste of your time. Um, but Iowa, Iowa State and Northern Iowa use what's called the Region Admission Index. 
So for a three school, they have the mathematical formula based on your GPA, based on your standardized test score. If you submit that and a number of kind of like, uh, core college courses you've taken or will take senior year, you do the numbers and you get a, a certain number. If you're above that, you're in. If you're below that, most likely you get denied. If it's a certain gray area, you could be uh, deferred or, or kind of wait for more information to come out. In University of Kansas, is even simpler than that. It says, what's your GPA? What's your standardized test score if you submit it? And if you're above a certain, you know, if you had a 21 and a 3.25 GPA, rock chalk, you could be cheering out of Kansas uh, for the national championship in a men's basketball tournament today. Uh, you know, you can look at it that way as well, too. So it's pretty simple. If you don't have the 21 or 3.25, just a, it just you got to have higher than one and to make up for, for the difference there, too. So... So there are several colleges that have the traditional, the old way of applying to colleges much easier, and they won't stress out as much, too, uh, as you do with the, with the common app as you get close to November 1st, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, so how are application reviewed? So I'm telling you, how do you apply? How are they going to look at it? Well, the, the Iowa system and Kansas and, and those type of schools, very simple. How they're looking at it, looking at the math. The math. Everywhere else is looking at the holistic approach. So what that means is they're looking at pretty much what I say is knowledge. They're looking at everything that you provide for the uh, to the college. So, uh, even if the, if things are optional, like standardized exams, for instance, you know I'll jump ahead. Sometimes that people are really worried about that. Uh, if the the school is test optional, um, they truly will not work against you if you do not provide a standardized exam. It truly is optional, but the uh, less information you give somebody to make a decision about you, uh, you know, the, the smaller piece of amount they have, and they may not be able to make an accurate uh, uh, you know, decision about who you are. Just think about sometimes, you know, if, you're, if your son or daughter is giving you some information, or you say, well, what happened there? Or, or can I borrow the car tonight? Where are you going? Out. Okay. Oh, well, here, here's the keys. Go ahead. Take it. Take my car. If, you, if they provide more information to you, you feel more comfortable with who they're going out with, where they're going, who they're going to be with, you know, whose house is going to be, how long they're going to be gone, so on and so forth. You can make a better educated decision to trust them with your car or not. Um, that goes with college admissions there too. So you have to provide your GPA. That is something that is not optional. Uh, that's some, one of the biggest things these days colleges really look at. There has been a growing trend, especially since the beginning of COVID and with, with standard exams being in flux, that colleges really like to see what you've done for three years. Okay, for three years of high school, because think about it, beginning of senior year, you're by November. Uh, so during your first semester, senior year, you only have six semesters of grades, and that's what they're looking at. So three years worth of grades versus three hours worth of a predictive success. And that's what a standardized exam saying is how successful you will be in college. Um, now, most schools are test optional these days. So if you do not provide them a score, they truly will not look and hold that against you. But if you have a good score, right, they'll look at it, and they're not going to look at it and say, well, you have a bad score. Okay, well, they're just not going to uh, evaluate you on that. But if you have a great score, you should send it to them because that's going to make you look much better, right? So if you have good information, you should send that to them too. So that's what colleges say. We would rather look at three years worth of your grades, three years worth of you versus three hours of you, uh, of how you well you've done. But there's a growing trend starting to come back now, which slowly is standardized exams. The University of North Carolina system has said that uh, for next year, they're going to require standardized exams again. Uh, uh, University of, of the Florida public schools have always required standardized exams. Um, the Georgia public school system, this past year, they went back to requiring exams. But now, on the flip side, for, for next year, uh, only the three big schools in, in interstate, including University of Georgia and Georgia Tech, you will be required to send your standardized exam. But all the other schools and public schools in Georgia, you do not have to. So it's all changing. MIT, I just read, uh, was going to require uh, standardized exams for next year again, too. So uh, that's something uh, to look to. So again, everything's changing these days. And this is the time that I'm doing my research to look at it. Um, essays are going to look at your essays, who you are, how you get your story out there, uh, you know, what you can tell them. They're looking at that as well. They're looking at your extracurriculars. Uh, if you're trying to piece together your life, outside of school, and that's what they're looking to do. If you're saying, okay, great, we know you go to school from eight to three, what do you do from three to midnight, for instance? So they wanna look at that and say, I do homework. Okay, that's nice, but what else do you do? How else do you get involved? And that's what they're looking at. 
And there's not necessarily one thing that, that holds more weight over another. They're looking for you to see how actively involved you get in something versus how many things you can be active in. Um, so if you get passionate about something, if it's a club, if it's a sport, they're not going to hold you against it. I played three sports for three seasons. But you don't have any clubs. Well, you did the sports, right? They get involved that way. So they're not going to hold it against you. Uh, you know, if you chose to have, uh, 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 you know, three jobs versus, uh, uh, you know, playing three sports, like, well, I've got three different jobs, I'm juggling, I'm doing all this, saving money for college, I'm not going to hold that against you as well, too. And then same thing for summer. What are you doing in the summer, then? As long as you're not the captain of the Couch Potato Club, they're really looking for you to do something in the summer. Did you get a job, did an internship, did you babysit a bunch, did you become a camp counselor, a lifeguard, what are you doing there? And then letters of recommendation to look at as well, too, to look at the character of you and and stuff like that as well. So, so there's a lot they're looking at uh, uh, for you in the application process as well, uh, too. So the best thing to say real quick, how to prepare for this is uh, take rigorous coursework. Um, colleges have usually said take the hardest courses you can succeed in, too. So again, don't take seven APs because that's going to look better on the college transcript. Well, C's in AP class are not going to look great in in, in the uh, you know, on your uh, on your transcripts, and so if you maybe cut that down to four, for instance, instead of seven, uh, and you'd be more successful that way. Uh, great, do that. You know, if it's not taking any AP in classes too, because that may not make you successful and stress you out. But if you got all A's throughout college prep classes throughout the whole time, colleges do want to see you trying to challenge yourself with an honors class. If you got all honors classes. Challenge yourself with a, with an AP class. So kind of move yourself up a little bit accordingly to challenge yourself too, but they also do not want you to stress yourself out as well too. Um, all right, so how do you apply to school? Let's take a quick drink here. All right, so the applications. So when, when are the uh, applications due? Well, this is where, you know, another uh, great area. Everything with college, is a, it, it all depends answer. Um, so here, so how, how to apply to college. So uh, there are all these different deadlines you can have. So the first one would be early decision, which is an ethically binding agreement. Now, there's a growing trend for ED2 to be out there, but ED1, early decision, is usually November 1st or November 15th. Depends what time of co or what college it is. And what this means is that it, when you apply to that school, you sign a form, your parents will sign that, and the school counselor would sign it that you will ethically agree. It's not illegal. So they're not going to come down to Plainfield and Juliet or Bonebrook and pick you up and say you have to go to that school. But if the school has it, so if, not all schools have that, by the way. If they have early decision, uh, you are trying to tell them, I will agree to attend your school if you accept me. And I'll withdraw my application for all other schools. And I will not know if I've been accepted to those other schools as well because I am going to your school. I'm committed to that. Colleges like this for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I always try to tell people, think about colleges like a business. They're run like businesses. They're very powerful, non-profit businesses that make a lot of money. Um, and yes, they can give you a great education. So you can get something out of it too, but right, they make a lot of money. They have great endowments and, and so on and so forth. Um, but they're run like a business. They're, 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 um, they're admissions office. So a great book, by the way, if people don't have it. So I, uh, to Tracy, you know, um, yeah, who gets in and why by uh, Jeff Salingo, um, a year inside the college admission. So again, that could be a book that uh, Tracy could help you find if you need it. It's a wonderful book about the uh, admission process, a little bit about the inside. It's written about two years ago. Uh, but anyways, uh, talking about colleges, like the idea that that like they're a business, and so if they could sell more seats early in the process, they don't have to worry about later in the process. Uh, like Harvard, for instance. Um, they accept about 2,000 students, about 1,600 will, will make up their freshman class. So if they can uh, fill many of the 1,600 seats early, they don't have to worry about later in the process who they have. They grab the top students that they want at that point as well. So it makes it easier on them. Uh, you as a student, you're done with the process. You're great. I've got into the school I want to. I don't have to go through any more stress, any more applications. I'm done with the entire process as well too. Um, colleges say that's the best way to tell them. You could always say in your application that you are my top choice. I've always wanted to go there. Then they say we should do it early decision. But you can only apply to one school, by the way, early decision. And the idea would be here, right? Because if you get accepted to two schools, you go to two schools early decision. You, you can't break yourself up in half unless you have a twin. Uh, but you can only go to one school. So you can only apply to one school for ED1. 
if you do get denied, you can go ED2. So that's a growing trend as well for colleges to try to grab a, a lot of great like students for the second time around who may have been denied to a school. Wow. Uh, may have been denied. Sorry about that. My camera fell here. Um, let me fix that up a little bit. So uh, a lot of students who might have been uh, denied uh, uh, in the ED1 process to be a great student as well. So they can go and, and they can kind of apply the second time around. So it's a great way. There are still great students out there is what they're trying to say. So uh, that's first one. But again, a small portion of students, I don't spend a lot of time on that, but it gets confusing. But a small portion of students apply uh, ED1. Uh, most one, biggest one I'd recommend would be uh, early action process as well, which just means college will take an earlier uh earlier action on your application. Um, a lot of decisions have just come out in the last couple of weeks. Those are for regular decision, kind of the last major deadlines as well too, but they have an earlier deadline that will take action, which traditionally had been mid to late December, let us you know. Now with the increase of applications, it has uh, bled into January and even February. I believe U of I was something like February 12th, 20th or something like somewhere right around there that they announced the early action and then on like march 21st they announced their uh their regular de decision there so the so early action is non-binding you can apply to as many schools as you want early action is something i recommend to try to get the earlier process done so really the big stress is done by november 1st to get your common application done and after that it becomes a lot easier as well because you have your essay done you have your application done and just kind of going school by school. So the, the November 1st is really the big big crunch actually there. Uh, and then like I said, uh, the regular decision starts December 1st, January 1st, January 15th, kind of every 15 days after November 1st is a deadline as well too. And some colleges still have rolling admissions. So for instance, you still can apply it to a large amount of colleges out there as well. And people don't necessarily realize, but those big, the big name schools, the ones here, that are in the uh, Wall Street Journal, right? The rankings that I keep handy right here because everybody loves rankings. They have the top 400 schools, you know, the top 100 schools. Their application deadlines have passed already as well, too. Um, but still plenty of colleges that have uh, room avail if rooms available. You can apply, and then two to four weeks later, they'll let you know if you're accepted now. And you can even apply to a lot of these schools before the first day uh, of school. So because there's still time to apply. So you don't always have to stress out in the beginning, but you know, it all, it all depends on what type of schools you're looking for. Uh, and which goes to the question, people say, well, how many schools should I apply for? Like, right? you know, how many schools should, should I apply? And it all depends what type of schools you're looking for. Uh, you know, I categorize, just like everybody else, the, the type of school that can even add a fourth category, I call them the, the lottery school these days, which is like Ivy Leagues, which are great, right? They're, they, they accept uh, students, and I've helped students this year get in Ivy League schools, but Right at at four percent, at three percent for Harvard, four or five, six percent. Right, it's very difficult uh, to be accepted to those schools. So those reach schools, those, those schools that are very difficult to get into, the highly rejective schools, perhaps is is a, is a slang term for them as well. Um, the match schools are schools that that which are harder to find, which are what is considered your match schools these days with so many more applications out there. Um, but match school schools, you should have a good chance of getting into. Right. Uh, uh, to get into if you apply. And then the safety slam dunk school, the schools that it shouldn't be a problem for you to get in. We'll just go University of Kansas, not trying to insult them, uh, but you know you have above, uh, you know, the certain ACT, SAT score, you have above that GPA, you know you're in. The rock chalk, I could be going to Kansas if I wanted to, right? So that could be a way to look at that as well, too, as a school you know you should get into. Um, 42% of people apply to about five to eight colleges, 30% apply to nine or above colleges. And I think that number probably would go up because the test optional these past years uh, and with the uh, lowering of admission scores and not really sure what a math school is, a math school is really becoming harder to, to figure out. Uh, so I think people are applying to more schools just to be safe or to say, well, I'm going to take a shot at Harvard. I don't have to send my test scores, so why not try with stuff like that. So, um, so really the number that your students should apply to, so I think to keep that one in mind, people say, well, how many schools should we apply to? Well, it depends. And here's what it depends on, the number of highly selective colleges you apply to. So so that's what I put in in, in the beginning right there. Um, and, and so uh, and I'm trying to remember what I put the asterisk on there today. I was going over to I'm going to put the asterisk, so remember that. But I think this idea that, you know, the highly selective schools are really becoming even more selective these days. So if you really are targeting those, 
as a T20 school, T30 schools, as, as the slang wants to be out there, as people call those, uh, you really have to apply to a lot more of those as those admission numbers are really getting lower and lower and becoming a lot more selective. And the the, the criteria, the, the, the holistic approach of looking at is really changing as well too these days. Um, another way to think about it too, the number of schools apply to is the excitement of your safety schools. So you can say, well, you know, if I don't get another school, I'll just go to this school. I'm going to use University of Kansas again. Again, I'm not picking on their application process. I think it's a wonderful application process and a great school. Uh, and they give some nice scholarships to Illinois students too, by the way. So it's a very affordable school. The grain of salt, right, because college is expensive. Uh, it, um, but they are um, they're great. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for those other six highly selective schools. If I don't go in, I'll be happy to go to the University of Kansas, and I'm fine with it. Then great. Then you don't have to apply to a ton of schools. Go for those reach schools. Try for it. No problem. If you, you know, uh, U of I engineering, very difficult to get into. Computer science program, very difficult to get into. Why not try? If you get in, great. You might go there. If you don't get in, you know what? That's okay. Rock chalk. I like Kansas as well, too. And in the end, of course, affordability, too. Like, um, if you do get into to Kansas or, or U of I, can you afford to pay that, too? So you might need to apply to more schools to find this is where the application, excuse me, the financial aid process goes early with the application, finding the right schools that you might need to apply to more schools to find the ones that will get you the the good financial aid offers, where if you limit yourself to the highly selective schools, where technically you may not get a lot of money at those schools. So if you, you know, will you be able to afford it where you're at and all that? So keep that one in mind too about uh, the affordability of your colleges. So you might need to apply to more just to make sure you can find schools that are affordable for you. Other things to consider in the application process is, is speaking of affordability, it costs it to apply to college. On average, $75 is a good estimate about what it's going to cost to apply to a college. So 75 times 10 schools is $750. That's expensive. I completely understand it as well. So if you want to save some of that money for college, you do that. Um, setting your ACT, SAT score. Again, every school is going to be different. They require that or not. Some say just they self-report it. Like U of I does, put it on the application. If we accept you and you choose to come here, then, then send us your score to verify that that was correct and all good there. Some schools still want you to send the ACT or SAT directly to them, which is a cost you about $13 per school that you send it to. Uh, and so it's going to start costing. That can start adding up to that $750 already that we talked about with the application. Letters of recommendation. You got to ask the teachers or counselors for them early enough to make sure they can write you a quality one and not a week before it's due. And by the way, it doesn't mean that if you ask five teachers for letters of recommendation, Tom said before, hey, the more information I can get them, the better they can look at me. If it's, they just want different applications. So if it's going to be the same, excuse me, letters of recommendations, uh, seeing the same thing, they don't want to read that. They just want to read different letters of recommendation about a different ways. So if you got to know a teacher in a different way, Maybe you actually struggled in the class and were successful later on. They're going to want to read that versus you breeze through that class. And so they have a different perspective from the teacher. Um, and the other thing to consider about the number of schools you apply to would be also your commitments time. Do you have enough time to write all those different essays? And they could add up by November 1st. Uh, I know, do, do you diversify your list and, and apply to some schools? Regular decision uh, versus early decision, or excuse me, early action because the, the, the deadline, right? Time becomes of the essence. So do you have time to do it? Which is why I recommend starting in the summer, to be honest with you. And then if your time crunch comes in, can you write a quality essay? But the biggest factor I always tell people to consider is to be honest with yourself to self-evaluate. It is okay if you don't get into an Ivy League school, if you don't get into a top 30 school, top 50 school. It is okay in life, and life will go on, and you will be great. Right? You will not get every job you apply for in this world, and that's okay too. Right, So be, uh, you know, self-evaluate. Be realistic in yourself in the end. Are you a quality candidate for them too? There's nothing wrong with trying. Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to try anyway. Good for you. Go for it. You know, I love helping people like that too because we can all dream, right? We, we, we should all dream and try that. Why not? Because you never know, right? It's out there, especially with test optional. You just don't know. You have a one barrier that has been uh, lower that you can try. Uh, but just don't think that it's all I eight Ivy League schools and that's it. 
I should get into one of those. I'm Valvictorian in my high school. Well, that's great, but there's a lot of Valvictorians in our high schools that don't get into those schools as well. Um, so yeah, so self-evaluate yourself to look at, at yourself to see, uh, uh, you know, where you, where you can be and which schools really are realistic for you as well too. Um, so one question popped up really quick because I'm done with this slide. So thanks for the question. Uh, so just starting to write your essay over the summer uh, after sophomore year. I would say no to that question. And that, I really don't say no to many things, a definitive answer, but I'll say no to that one because you just don't know. The essay prompts could change a little bit uh, for the for the for by the time uh, your son or daughter becomes a senior in high school. Uh, one thing it, it wouldn't hurt, you could sketch some out. How about that? It doesn't hurt to brainstorm some different ideas. Um, I actually had a client uh, uh, who's currently a senior, and um, he did sketch a whole bunch of out uh, throughout the throughout this time of junior year. He just would sit down. He had some time. He had an idea. He would write about it. And then so as we started working on the essays, well, I have these seven different essays here. And they were truly rough drafts, by the way. You know, we were truly like, well, here's an idea. I go with this. And we went through. And we went, that is a really good one, interesting one. So just you could try it, sketch something out. You never know when you might need an essay for something. Uh, but maybe uh, after um, sophomore year, it'd be a great time this summer to to put together a resume. Uh, uh, just something for you know all your extracurriculars, uh, stuff you've done, school information on there because. As an adult, we all know uh, it is something good to have a resume. I actually needed one recently. I have my own business. I had my own business for 10 years, but I was applying for, for a, a professional organization, and they wanted my resume. And I'm like, okay. Went through my files, had one, had to update it a little quick, uh, and then I, I was able to send it out to them. So it's always good to have a resume and file, right? So that could be something you could work on as well. But like I said, why not try some of those essays, sketch them out, see what's there, get some brainstorming ideas out there. That never hurts as well, too. So thanks for that question. Appreciate that. Um, as we go through the process, application decisions, you could be accepted to school. You're in deferred, especially the earlier process. If your early decision could be deferred to the regular decision pile, early action deferred to regular decision. But once you get the regular decision, you're either accepted to the school, you're denied from the school. And generally, you can appeal, but unless there's something grossly wrong with your application that you made a huge mistake or, or there's just something wrong with it, it's very difficult to appeal and then get accepted. But generally, you get accepted, denied, or put on the wait list for the school. And the wait list means that if after May 1st or even slightly before that, they realize they're not going to uh, get the amount of students that they believe that they are, are targeting for their freshman class, they'll go to the wait list and, and start offering people off the wait list. The one thing about the wait list these days, to be honest with you, they are growing in number for whatever reason. Colleges want to make sure they're going to get their numbers. You do not know your number in the waitlist line. You don't know if you're number one or you could be number 5,000, for instance. So, uh, so you just don't know where you're at in the process. They never tell you uh, where you're at in the process. So just kind of move forward, live your life like you're doing, for, going for other school. And if it comes, great. You can make the decision at that point as well, too. But generally, waitlist students are a few small amounts of students who ever get uh, off the waitlist because the one thing the colleges do is that they say Harvard uh, accepts 2,000 students traditionally, but about 1,600 traditionally will accept that offer. So they have their wiggle room right there, but for whatever reason, if 1,550 accepted, they'll go to the wait list for the next year 50 students, which is generally not that number. But if all 2,000 students, by the way, could be a question, accepted their offer and admission that they have to uh, let all 2,000 students into the school, that is something that is uh, is ethical on their part that they have to do as well. As long as you you let them know by National College Acceptance Day by May 1st, because all college acceptances are guaranteed until May 1st. Uh, after May 1st, you can still get into the school of your choice if there is space remaining, they do not have to uh, allow you in at that point. So, uh, but you have to send uh, some sort of a deposit by that point, a couple hundred dollars uh, to get in as well too. So for instance, seniors who just found out from Ivy Leagues uh, last end of last week, they have a month to make a decision what school they wanna go to. Um, question came in, do I have a resume builder recommendation for high school students? 
Um, I have my own personal templates, to be honest with you, that I have. I, I don't know online or where you can find it. Honestly, uh, you could always uh, just Google, you know, uh, high school resume if, if you needed some of that. A resume for a high school student because it is slightly different, right? Uh, for everything, you know, you kind of want your school information on there, your extracurriculars, and then your maybe like jobs or experiences if you have like internships or your jobs on there. Something that separates you from that you did at schools and maybe awards and it is perfectly fine to have a college resume that's over one page. I know that's kind of the, the stigma. You have to have a one page resume, but uh, it's okay for a high school student to go over those one pages. It's perfectly fine to do that as well. But just keep it to what you've been in, in high school, for instance, and do not put anything from middle school on there because they're only evaluating what you from high school. Unless you participate in uh, dance, you've been a dance since you've been in fourth grade. Well, then put it from fourth grade to present. You're still doing that. Not a problem there. Um, I'm just going to interject real quick and just put a little plug in for library online resources. Right. Um, if you go to the Plainfield Public Library website, we have a service called Help Now, which is through BrainFuse. And they have uh, there's they have a job now function as well where they have uh, resume building help there where you can get live help to get your resume built. So that may be a way to go as well. And I will get the link and pop that into the chat as well. All right, Trey, thank you so much for popping in. That's a great resource. The library, like I said, is always a great resource. So thank you for that. Perfect. All right. Thanks for that question, too. All right. So moving along here, too. I know another uh, the big elephant in the room is the uh, financial aid portion here, too. So uh, like I said before, early in the process, uh, early in the, in the presentation, that the uh, FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, um, it is uh, the start to the uh, to your financial aid process here for, for college. Um, so this is something that's Illinois State uh, graduation requirement, or you can opt out of it. There's a form you can uh, you can do uh, through your uh, public high school in order to uh, to opt out of this as well. But what this is this is something you will complete during your son or daughter's senior year of high school. So when they're applying for college, you're applying for the FAFSA for financial aid. Now this is a government form. This is one one of the million things that get uh, confusing here about the college uh, process is that. This is this goes to the government, and then this information from the government goes to the schools. There are a place for you at the end to put this in to send it to the different schools. So this is not actually the the way for you to get the uh, the the money from the school. And what they say on this form doesn't mean that that's how much you're going to receive from schools because every school is different in price. Um, the Ivy Leagues, right, are uh, mid eighty thousands. I uh, even can't look at you when I when I uh, say that. Versus U of I, which could be for in state student thirty five thousand dollars. So, if the whatever says here that you can only pay twenty five thousand dollars a year, well, that means the Ivy League should be giving you more money than U of I because it's much more expensive. So keep that in mind too. This is just a start the gateway of this, and you complete this in your son or daughter's senior year of high school but they use prior prior year information. So what that means is, is like, for instance, this, this current year uh, of seniors that are applying for college entrance in, for 2022, that means they're using last year's tax, or excuse me, 2020 tax information uh, as well. So if you have a current uh, junior in high school, which you'll be applying in the fall for 2023, you'll be using last year's tax information as well too. So what this means in the end, as I confuse you, if you currently have a sophomore in high school, just like my neighbor over there, right? You all know uh, him, um, that his daughter is currently a sophomore in high school and he's currently in his prior, prior year. So pretty much the, in the easiest thing, and Tracy always has me in for a good financial aid presentation, um, is that uh, uh, sophomore, first sem second semester sophomore year, first semester junior year, that's the year of your, your taxes you will use. So all the money you make, all the money you don't make, for instance, but that's what's going to be determined your first year of financial aid in, in uh, for college. So, and you want to complete this every year that you're seeking financial aid for your son or daughter in college. So, so if they want to become a freshman, October first, again, you do it for sophomore year, for junior year, for senior year, and probably, hopefully, they graduate in four years. And once you're a senior, you won't be completing it because they won't need it for the following year. So that's quick in nutshell about the FAFSA. But like I said, it's not the end of be all; it's the start of the application process. And by the way, Tracy put in the comment section the, the link to the brain fuse. If, if you're looking for that, I'm sure that'd be a great resource to look for the uh, resume builder recommendations right there. So great uh, work there. Um, 
So looking here, um, so the FAFSA, again, you should complete it if you're looking for financial aid. If you're looking for merit aid, right, based upon uh, how well uh, your academics, you may or may not need to complete that. But if you're looking for need-based financial aid, which means, you know, you do not make enough money, you need some help pay for it, like most of us when you help pay for college, that's looking for it, including government loans, because this is going to the government. This is the kind of the loan application for those uh, those uh, uh, government loans as well, too. Um, I would say complete it as early as possible in the month of October. Doesn't mean you need to do it October 1st as well, too. Um, so, so something to keep in mind there. Uh, there is more money available early in the process, which usually means by, say, the early action deadline. If they have an earlier deadline, that's application deadline. That's usually the deadline you want to complete the FAFSA by. So, you uh, and so the students should apply to to get for financial aid. So it doesn't mean you need to be up, you know, uh, at midnight. October first hits, you start doing the FAFSA. Some point in October, it's okay. And again, it's a gateway to financial aid. It's not the key to paying for college uh, as well, too. So keep that one in mind. And changes are coming to the FAFSA. They keep delaying it a little bit, but there are some changes coming to the FAFSA. To me, what I've read in the end, it's just shortening a number. It's just kind of combining questions together that make it sound because currently there's 108 questions that people think that's way too long, but the type of question, the main questions that they need to ask you, the financial questions are not going to be short. So it's going to be the same thing pretty much in the end. It's just going to sound better at being a shorter version. Um, CSS profile is another financial aid form that you may need to complete as well. If uh, your uh, son or daughter is going for a highly selective school or those very expensive uh, out-of-state public schools like University of Michigan, Georgia's tech instance as well too, it just uh, has a... Uh, uh, more information or looking for you uh, about your family finances as well too but that could be a good thing because the fafsa is very black and white and you want to say a lot of, but but I, I you can't say but on the fafsa it is pretty much yes or no how much money did you make put it on there but I, I i got a lot of money i sold a house and i didn't get i didn't put buy my new house and make sure they don't care css profile is a lot of ways you can explain things like that as well too but in the end, I also say that college admissions offices and college financial aid offices are very nice people, to be honest with you. So don't be afraid to ever contact them before the process of questions, after the process. If I have a family of a current senior in here and you have questions, contact them. They're actually great people who want you to attend their school. Uh, and yes, they are not necessarily giving up the most amount of money, but they want to try to give you money. They want you to try to accept their offer of admission to the school. So contact them with the questions. They will work with you to see what they can to help you. In the end, they may not be able to help you, right? But they actually do want you to attend their school. So contact them. They're, they will try to help you as much as they can. Um, if you want to figure out what I'm talking about or how much schools may cost you, uh, you can estimate financial aid using these different calculators. Uh, the first one, a college scorecard. Pretty much you can find all this information on the college scorecard as well, too. It has turned into a great website, a great resource uh, for a bunch of statistics. If you want to do some quick research on colleges, you can go to college scorecard. If you want to look for financial aid information, you can go on there. Like I said, I, I'm not in Zoom, so it's kind of harder for me to share my screen, and uh, I don't want to lose you. Um, so, but if you want to, you can find a lot of information and you can even do quick kind of service level. If you make this amount of money, this is what people tend to pay at, at this uh, school. You kind of have a, a, a kind of charts and graphs like that as well too. But the two biggest things that you can find on that site would be the FAFSA forecaster. So if you want to figure out what this FAFSA might be, what information they're looking at, doesn't matter if you have a junior or a freshman, you have a fourth grader like me. If you want the FAFSA forecaster, you can type in information that is not safe and figure out what the federal government may think is your estimated family contribution. So what they estimate you, they feel you can pay for one year of college. So you can have that information back in mind that hmm, there's no way I can afford that. And I usually say, don't worry about it. Colleges probably much think you should um, uh, uh, you know, pay uh, a little bit more than that as well, too. But it gives you a good start to the whole process, but you can use that EFC you get to do net price calculators, which you can find through the college scorecard as well. You, every college has to have a net price calculator on their website. And what this is, 
is you complete it's about two years old though so keep that with a grain of salt too so you can probably pay more than that but this net price calculator will give you the net price of what you may pay for one year of college based on the financial aid information that you put in so my neighbor next door who has a sophomore and you listening at home and tracy there as well um everybody we have different financial situations and so this is what to find out what you may pay. So you, even though I mentioned that college scorecard has a great charging graph, you make this amount of money or thereabouts, you can get this amount of money. This can tell you a little bit more specific about what you think you can pay. So as you, this is why I say the financial aid process is early uh, in, in the in the college selection process. You can say, great Northwestern, how much would I pay for Northwestern based on my information? Now, complete net price calculator. Say, huh, I'm not paying eighty thousand dollars. I can pay only forty. Well, that's pretty affordable. Or you can say 40, I still can't afford $40,000 a year times four years. So you can look for other schools and go through that process and you'll get quicker. It takes you five to 10 minutes to do that now. But as you know, the questions you're asking, you can kind of zip through it really quick. Um, and you can find out a, a good ballpark figure of what you might uh, pay for it. So I highly recommend this college scorecard and a net price calculator uh, to help you with some of your college research as well. Uh, in the financial aid award package, so get in there really quick, what you may receive. So what the current seniors might have received recently has been scholarships, which are merit-based. So scholarships are merit-based. <laughs> Grants are need-based financial aid that may come from the government or from the school themselves. But it's based upon their, their financial need for the school. Scholarships are based on merit, uh, merit, but not every college will give out merit-based scholarships. The uh, Ivy Leagues do not give it out because... Everybody's a fantastic student who wanted to go to Columbia, so they don't need to give it out because everybody's great. So they don't give out merit-based scholarship, only financial need, but they're very generous with financial need if you are if you need, if they determine you need it. Work study, your son or daughter gets a job on campus, paid for by the federal government, so you get some pocket money there. And then the dreaded loans will come in the financial aid package, which chances are they're packaging the loans to make the school look that much more affordable for you, so read all the figures is not even hidden on there. They'll put it in theirs alone, but read all your lines as well, too. Um, so again, the, now, so here we go. So I threw a bunch of information at you in the past, say, 55 minutes as well, too. So I'll quickly kind of finish up this presentation now. Uh, but what we're looking at here, too, is a timeline. So through all these things at this time and this time. So here we go. Second semester sophomore year to first semester junior year. That's your prior, prior years so your financial aid information is being determined that year for your FAFSA. All right. So by March 31st of junior year, yes, yeah, so that passed. But this happened actually uh, in February. The co common app essay prompts were announced. So if you are a junior, those was what you will be writing uh, in, in the fall. Uh, the colleges will be looking for the for the common app here too. Again, if you're younger than that, you want to sketch something out, great. If you want to sketch out anything you want to write about, it doesn't matter. Those prompts are so general that even when I'm helping students with, with the with the essays, I don't even want to show them the, the, the uh, essay prompts because sometimes they have a preconceived notion in their mind. I just start brainstorming, what do you want to talk about? And then we, we start going from there and getting ideas about what to write about too. So. So uh, that's junior. So as your rising senior summer, right? It's a great term, rising senior, rising summer. So by your rising senior, so summer going into senior year, start beginning those common application prompts. Start looking for those uh, supplemental essays. Start completing the common application. If that's a big key right there. Start completing the common app and get all that, quote, boring information out of the way so you're not stressed out about that in the beginning of senior year and all you're worried about are essays. But get a good draft of your, of your common app essay going through as well too because it could take you it's funny it takes people a long time to develop a good common app essay and then they realize oh, i want to apply to this school uh and deadlines coming up in three days and, and they pound out an essay really quick about it and it's funny but it takes us three months to write a common app essay but you're learning how to write a college essay it is completely different than an english class or a history class so i just want to beat up on english teachers um then a history class is a completely different type of essay, and there are a lot of rules that get thrown out that English teachers do not like. Um, but you can do that because your essay. So those are things that develop and go through as well too. But starting going senior year now, so August first, the Common App opens, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, that they can't complete that stuff earlier. They just can't enter in their Common App essay if they haven't completed before August first. 
But other than that, all the information, so it really, you can create an account by, by junior year. So if you're this time, you're a junior right now, you can create a common app. Uh, prom, I'm kind of your software, you can probably do it too, but you can create a common app account and throughout the summer, you can start adding information to it as well. And it will not be deleted. Uh, it shuts down for a couple of days in July and then it reopens August 1st, but that information will still be there. They just pretty much wipe out the essays uh, uh, that are on there. So so you can complete some of the common app now. So don't, oh, don't sit around or have your son or daughter say, can't do anything, mom, it's not August 1st yet. Yes, you can. Uh, September 1st, pretty much all the applications will open at that point. October 1st, your FAFSA, as we mentioned, goes live. You can start completing that. The first deadlines technically are October 15th, like UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, they have an October 15th deadline, but a small handful of school. University of South Carolina, who won the women's NCAA championship last night, uh, they have an October 15th early action deadline, but a small handful of school. Uh, Schools will have that deadline. Most of them have a November 1st deadline. That's your first really major deadline right there. And about 15 days, uh, uh, every 15 days that are on and so forth, uh, you have an application deadlines as well. By mid-December, you'll find out if you received entrance in your ED. They will let you know much earlier, December 1st, December 15th or so. Uh, early action starts to trickle out. There's still a good amount of handful of school that will tell you. Uh, um, by mid-December, by before winter break, but it starts to go into January and even February now for early uh, early action to let you know. January 1st-ish to January, sometimes January 15th, sometimes February 1st. It kind of trickles um, your last regular decision deadline. But I think January 1st in the back of your mind is really the last uh, major deadlines uh, for colleges. Again, there's still rolling decisions out there as well too, but a lot of those major big-name colleges uh, those deadlines kind of end around January 1st. By mid-March, you'll find out uh, if you've been accepted for those, uh, those regular decision deadlines as well, too. By April 1st, they tell you by, but usually by mid to late March, you'll know your financial aid awards will be given to you by that point as well. And then colleges will give you until May 1st to make your uh, final college acceptance. Again, you can go afterwards. You do not have to commit by that date, but if you've been accepted, you're guaranteed it by that point. But it doesn't mean that, again, I'm even working with a senior right now who honestly hasn't applied to any colleges yet, too. But there's colleges for everybody out there. So please keep that in mind that just because the Wall Street Journal uh, prints uh, out the top uh, schools doesn't mean those are the colleges for your son or daughter. They can still apply to the process now. There are still some great schools that this student is looking to, uh, to attend that he can still apply to. And that's OK, too. So remember. You don't have to get stressed out over this entire process as well to pick your path and go with it. Uh, final four tips here. Time management here too. I like that other one. I think I might have said it in here somewhere, but pick your path and go with it. And, and that's it. College is a process. So it kind of goes along with that. College is a process. Start the process early. Pick a path. You can veer off the path and go somewhere else. That's okay too. But, but don't stress out what other people are doing. Kind of know what your lane is and kind of go with it there too. Um, you know, so so have early conversations over your son and daughter about colleges, about schools they might want to attend, about the financial aid process, especially how much money there is for college, how much college is, uh, you know, your expectations for them, what their expectations might be. You know, start talking about this even before freshman year, but especially freshman year now, so everybody knows what the process may entail. Standardized exams, you don't have to wait to the free exam in April uh, to take it. You can take it early, earlier than that. You can take it in sixth grade if you wanted to. You don't need to, right? But you can take it earlier and stuff like that and develop that, that resume and extracurricular so you're not like, oh, I need to fill out my uh, extracurricular. They're going to join a bunch of clubs senior year. That might be a little too late. So start early in this process. Essay writing tips. So you gotta set uh, once junior ends, start give yourself time to look at it because again, you you will write it, uh, brainstorm it, and the way I develop it with students, it really takes a while, right, to do it. You will have multiple edits. A good essay has six or seven edits to it probably as well. Uh, those last couple are pretty quick tweaks and all that stuff, but but you want to make sure it's just perfect, right? Because my idea here is apply the proper amount of time needed for the next four years of your life. So don't do it for four minutes for four years, right? Take your time and do it right. And it doesn't mean you need to work on it every single day in the summer. You can work on it for a little bit, put it away, 
come back to it, edit it, right? Rinse and repeat and come back to it. But it doesn't mean you need to do it once, right? Throw throw a, a um, um, you know, brainstorm it, throw it something down on the computer, walk away, come back a couple days later, look at it, what you have, does it make sense? What I'm talking about, elaborate on some things, walk away, come back to it, right? A little bit each day, you'll get the job done. Uh, for the financial aid process, uh, 85 to 90 percent of all your scholarships will actually come from the colleges themselves. So this is where I said the financial aid process is very uh, important and to look and getting the right school that can be affordable for you. But those net price calculators will help you out to find those schools as well, too. Um, outside scholarships are great, but they're not easy to win. They're, you always hear a story about, you know, you'll hear that story coming out soon that the one student has won all these different scholarships. Great, right? You got to put in the time and effort to win those, but it doesn't mean you're going to win those even if you apply to a whole bunch of scholarships. So uh, so you have to really work on it. It's a job if you want to win those. So keep that one in mind. I'm not saying not to do that, but the local scholarships are the best ones to win because there's a lot less people to do that. So go to your counseling office and ask them. There are some reputable websites. I'm happy to share those websites with you as well if you want to email me and I can send that information to you as well. Uh, and just remember in the end, 85 to 90% of scholarships come from the colleges, but if a college is a REIT school, meaning academically you may not qualify to get in, but you do get in, right? You took that chance at dream school and you got in, don't expect many, much money from them, so keep that one in mind, because there's no big incentive for them to have you on campus. If they don't have you on campus, the school will go on, the academics will be fine. We're like, great. We took a chance on you, but we're not going to, you know, we, we're going to put you on the team, but we're not going to guarantee you're going to play. So that's kind of the idea. So if you want to be on the team, you can, but if you don't, eh, there's no loss to us. So keep that one in mind. So that's the idea about the REACH schools academically will could be become a REACH for your financial. It may not be able to afford it. Um, did I skip one? Oh, three. I missed my final four tip there, too. Don't know what happened to that there. So I guess that's where I'll say here too, though, is that remember it, stay in your lane. That's my final four tip right there. I throw in, stay in your lane. It's so much easier for me to say that because I'm not the one emotionally involved in this, right? Uh, you guys are as parents, right? You want the best for your children. Uh, you know, the students have all their friends applying for the school at the same time, and it's so easy for you to compare yourself to them. Uh, but you just can't, right? You just don't know information. Why do they get more money? Why did they get in and I didn't? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I have a better GPA than them. You, you're right, you do. So if you compare those things, you're correct. You're, you're better than them in that. Have a better SAT score. You're right. You're better than them in that. So what else do they have that you didn't have, and what are they looking for that you just don't know about? So it's not a referendum on yourself. Don't take it personally. Easy for me to say that, but just try not to do that. So, again, if you want to uh, send me an email, copy my presentation, feel free to do that. Uh, text me as well. Call me if you want. Uh, I'll be happy to do that as well. That's easier for you as well. So. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate that today. Uh, I think Tracy, uh, we back there. She comes back around. So thanks again. I'll be here for questions. Yep. I'll stop talking for a minute. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We will hang out here for a couple of minutes to see if any pop up. But thanks again, Tom. That was, as always, great information. Very helpful. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Trace. Thanks for the kind of words and thanks for jumping into. Again, the library's got a lot of great resources that we have. You know, again, as awesome. the SAT standard that exams are test optional, never hurts to take the exams and have it in your back pocket. That's so, right. so I recommend you know to take that practice, practice SAT. So, and you can also uh, brain fuse. I'm going to pump them up again. We talked about it for resumes, but they also have. Um, for uh, school help as well. So you can take some of those practice tests on there as well. You can uh, prep for other types of tests. They will help. They have live tutors every day. So great services you can get with your library card through our website. Do you guys access the Khan Academy as well? Uh, not through our website. Uh, a lot of that is free that you can then use for Khan Academy. Sure. So. Right, right. OK, I wasn't sure if you had it through there. I know there are good resources as well, too. But Yeah, they're fantastic. But just a good library resources. They're great, too. <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions just yet. We'll give it about one more minute and see if anything comes in. And then I'm going to put your email up on the screen one more time. So if anyone wants to send you an email, they have that as well. And again, if people have questions and they can't think about it now, they can reach out to me. I'm sure they can reach out to Tracy as well, too, and she can get a hold of me if you want me. Or if not, 
you know, speak as a Tracy for, for uh, great resources. I'm going to put my email in the chat right now if anyone wants to send me an email. And if you need help with the online resources or any other questions, just contact me anytime. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions, Tom, so I think we're going to say good. Oh, uh, we just got to thank oh, you. Fine. Thank you very much. We can't work. Very useful information, as always. Oh, there's a good question. Yep. Should you take both the SAT and ACT? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you can't because in the end, um, right, you will do better on one of them than the other one. Chances are. Um, but it's not necessarily needed to take both of them. Uh, you'll get the free one if you go to a public high school. Uh, uh, but again, if you want to try the other one, sometimes you just say if you'll do better on one or the other if you kind of evaluate which one you could be better at. Um, or if you're trying to, if you're trying for a certain score, a certain range, and if you uh, are just not getting that with one of them, you know, try to switch to the other one because you, you, you might do a little bit better as well too. But there is no need to take both. Many students do take both, to be honest with you, but uh, usually kind of figure out the one they want and they kind of uh, take that. Or if you just stay in your lane, as I use that line, and you just took one of them, you'll be fine. College will take either one or neither. All right. Thanks for the kind of words too, Laura, by the way. Uh, Jeff here says, what are the best ways to find colleges that are matches for you? Oh, that's a tough answer question here too. Um, I guess, like I said, the hard one is, is to figure out like what is a match for you. I completely understand that. It's a very open-ended question. Um, if you're just looking for the data, like the college scorecard, it could be a great resource, as I mentioned. Just to look at the median, which is the middle 50% of accepted students for standardized exams for uh, grade point averages. Again, take that with a grain of salt because with schools being test optional for the last two years, uh, standardized exams could be the students who accepted, who submitted test scores. And so some not everybody did as well too. Um, but the college scorecard in the end, I think will be a good resource. If you're, you're looking for an answer, I know that. I would say uh, maybe look at the college scorecard for, for some of those kind of statistical information as well too, to kind of try to uh, get you started with the process there. Uh, the college board website has some features as well, too, to kind of try to help match you up a little bit, too. So college board website could be one way to look at that, too. Jennifer, a nice comment. Thank you very much for that, Jennifer. All right. I think we're going to say good night. Uh, this recording will be up for a week, so if you need to come back and get any of those links or uh, email, the, the video will still be available here at the same YouTube link, so you can still access it over the next week or so. Thanks so much again, Tom. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tracy. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.